So these cameras in those days were called view cameras. Uh, they were album and prints, uh, printing out of paper print, and it took one and a half to two hours to actually get that print done, which is why sometimes in some of the photographs, you'll fly in certain areas which are blurry when the coconut trees, leaf was waving about, huh, it comes out as a bit of a blur. And they, were, uh, you, they used a very complicated, labor-intensive, sometimes dangerous process of, called the paper negative process as well. I want to first start with Captain Linear Stripe. He's someone that we should really be proud of as having been somebody who was so passionate about our history and heritage and someone who was very closely associated with Madhav. Linear Stripe, we know, was, um, he worked in the, in the uh, British Army uh, till around 1839, but at some point in time, he's figured out that his real passion in life was photography. Um, and uh, what Tripe, Tripe had done was, he, when he was in the army, he'd taken some photographs of Belur and Halabed and Karnataka on a personal visit. And uh, I think that was the kind of interest that brought him to become a teacher at the College of Arts in 1855. When Linear Strike was a teacher at, uh, in the college, he also had a deputy with him called Ayar Sami. Ayar Sami, we know, had a photography studio by himself in Madras, but sadly we have no photographs, we don't know where the studio was. So maybe if you've got, you know, connections of your great grandparents in Madras, go and check if you've got any photographs of them and see if it says, Ayasami studio. That would be a great find for us today if we can find those. So Ayasami obviously had a studio here and made a lot of money, but um, we know that he was he was very fond of Tripe and Tripe was very fond of them. And in 1856, because Tripe was such a good photographer and so committed to his task, he was appointed as the official photographer. So as um, the, the government of Manas presidency appointed him as an official photographer in 1856, his highest priority was to photograph objects in the presidency that were of interest to the antiquary, the architect, the sculptor, the mythologist, and the historian. Right? So that's what seems to have been very important. And between 1856 and 1860, no doubt guided by people like Thomas Daniel, who toured India before, then superintendent, head of the Archaeological Survey of India, and many other, and of course the local collectors, the governors, tried to decide on a tour across South India. And his photographs of Tanjavur, of course, are famous, but there are several other photographs that he's taken of various other places, right from Chengalpet, Kanjipuram, and all of them are very, very, have, have detailed notes behind them in terms of where they were shot and some technical details as well. He certainly, I think one thing that we can learn from him is a, is a great sense of thoroughness in what he did. Very, very clear and honest and, and thorough about what he did. Um, but Trent had, I think by then, he was a bit of a misfit in terms of other photographers and, and many of the others in the British Raj. Because as Tribe visited more and more of these temples, and it was difficult at that time for people like him to visit temples because wasn't allowed entry into most of the parts of the temple. Right? It, was, it was a time when casteism was very high and temple entry was restricted. Must have definitely found it difficult. But despite whatever he went, somewhere I think he started realizing, uh, much to the discomfort of his boss, who was Brit, who was in Ras presidency, with the, that Indian culture and heritage were a lot more powerful and had a lot more to offer to the West than the government actually gave credit for. And he felt that these temples, and he was very worried, and, 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 uh, and, and I really wish some of us were as worried as he was, because even in those days of 1856, he was very worried that if these temples weren't photographed accurately and recorded for posterity, the British government and the Indians and the natives and all of them will actually tear them down. And he, he, it, it really bothered him that in those days, either the government or the natives were not interested in preserving and taking care of these monuments as much as they should. As they should. And reading, I've not, I've not been able to quote that over here because it's a long passage, but reading those extracts from his diaries when he talks about the pain and the sadness he goes through in seeing many of these temples being dilapidated, it really touched to our heartstrings, and, and, and if we had if we had paid heed to his word of words of advice in those days, I'm sure a lot of our temples and structures would have been much better. And clearly, I would think he was one of those rare um, Englishmen who saw the need for uh, for us to preserve our heritage long before Indians realized it ourselves. So. Um, he, he was fascinated with the temples, their size, regardless of whether they would have seen they, they were photographically important or not. And very, very few of his uh, 
photographs actually had people in them. All the other photographers typically had people in them, more for a, for a colonial attitude because they were also saying, okay, I want to show the, the guys back home what an Indian is dressed like. Yeah? Because for people back home, India and Indians were all animals of some sort, right? no clue what was going on over here. So they always had tribes photographs, invariably don't have people standing there because he said, they distracted away from my purpose. My purpose was to record these buildings for posterity because if I don't do it today, very soon they are all going to become roofless ruins and piles of rubbish and bubble. You'll never find that. The most brilliant work that Kite did were these long photographs. Right? Um, those of you who have been to the Brahadisura temple, around the main temple are several inscriptions. All these are from the time of Rajaraja the first. They all talk about various land grants that were given to the temple. I think most of you would know that what percentage of inscriptions and in temples have something to do with religion? One, one less than one. Any other guesses from here? What percentage of inscriptions have something to do with uh, religion? Nothing. Zero. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Zero percent. So all of these have nothing to do with no Stalaparama nonsense over here. It's all complete information about land grants and, uh, and uh, people that who were gifted to the temple and how the temple administration should be run. Uh, we have by then slowly started figuring out what these inscriptions meant. Right? Because way back in the 1860s, 1880s, uh, the Archaeological Survey of India had initiated the epigraphic survey. And in those days, they were not so much worried about what the inscription contained, they were more worried about you know who built the temple kind of stuff. So it was around tribes time that people had first discovered that the Brahadishwara temple was built by a Choda king called Rajaraja. We still hadn't figured out the date, but we knew it was Rajaraja. It was a little after 1860 that we figured out that Mahabalipuram was actually a port city of the Pallavas. All these things that we take for granted today were all found by epigraphists in those days and that's a lovely talk by itself. So we won't get into that about all the troubles they went through into finding this. But when tribe photographed this, he had no clue of what these read. But he knew that they were important, they had to be preserved, otherwise they had all become rubble. And he took photographs using a very rare technique, which I'm sure must have taken him days and days to do, which was every part of the inscription was photographed and then sealed and stitched together. And they were found a roll like this. Right? It is such a tragedy today that none of these rolls survive in India. He must have made nine or ten of these, none of them survive in India. We know for sure one survives in the Canada uh, Montreal Museum of Photography Art or something like that. We have one in Canada, I don't know, we probably have one in the UK as well, but all the other copies are lost. Um, there have been paper reproductions of these uh, in, in books, uh, but they look pretty much similar to this. I've scan, just scanned one picture. Um, it's, not a, it's not a great shakes today because all these inscriptions have been read, they're still available, you can go and see them. But for the fact for somebody in 1855 to put this kind of effort, it must have taken him at least a month to do this, I'm sure. Take this effort, do it in such a precise way, that deserves a lot of respect. So it was really, so by 1856, when, what happened in 1856, 57? The Great New War of Independence, right? So because of the War of Independence, people, uh, people like tribe who thought that you know the culture in India was actually much better than the culture in uh, in the UK, they started getting a little unpopular, and the government was not very happy with this kind of a concept. So somewhere in 1856 or 1860, 1860, 1861, tribe was asked to wind up his business. He sold his uh, he sold his equipment and he stopped being the the official photographer. But he still did take some photographs. He was still a very popular photographer at that time. And um, finally, he moved to Malta for some time and went back to Plymouth where he died. Uh, and Plymouth was also where he was born. So that's right. He died in 1902 in Plymouth. Uh, it's such a tragedy that, you know, he, so much of his photographs have survived, but I've not been able to get a photograph of himself. There's a photograph available on the net of his gravestone. But not of himself. So I, I mean that's I think typical tribe for you. Someone who put his his vocation above himself. Someone who truly fought and did his bit for the for the cause and for heritage and really didn't worry about you know putting his stamp on everything. But his photographers still speak. His photographs still speak of the excellent work that he did. So that's right. What is the date? Eighteen eighty. Ah, Stands for 18 no, 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 no. 1802, I think. 
1832. One of the photographs I was taken, um, you see, um, this was um, all of this at one time, it had a pillared portico, there was another level of portico over here. I think now with the archaeological survey, we've tried to demolish a little bit of this in the name of restoration. But at one point in time, the Baladishwara temple had a portico around in, in, in two levels. And this was, that entire part was funded by the uh, military uh, chief of staff for Rajaraja called Krishnan Raman, who was a Brahmin, that's all we know about him. I just want to take a couple of minutes here to talk about the Chola bureaucracy. Why is it important first for us to, why are we singing the praise of these Chola kings? I think that's something important we need to understand. The Cholas were really powerful in the 11th and the 12th centuries. At the height of their power, their territory started in the south with all of Sri Lanka. In the west, it was all the way to Maldives. In the east, it was all the way to Kadara, which is today called Kedah, Malaysia. Right? In the north, they went all the way up to Ganges. Much bigger in size than what India is today. And they were able to manage this fairly, fairly efficiently for at least three or four generations of kings and then, you know, good food and, and laziness caught up with the kings. But they were, a, I think what is remarkable when you read inscriptions of the Chola period is their ability to decide on what was important for them to keep control of and what was okay for them to delegate. Modern managers and leaders can take a lot of good advice from this. The king was very, very focused in terms of what he wanted. What was topmost priority for the king? Take a guess. Military. Why? Why military? Why? Absolutely. Law and order was primary because if if someone overthrew him, he would be killed. Right. So his life was at stake. So number one, feed the army, keep the army happy, keep the army fighting all the time. Number one. Number two, it was what gave him the money? Taxes. Trade. Taxes. And taxes from where? Trade. 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 Not so much trade. Agriculture, agriculture right? Yeah. Predominantly agricultural economy. So, taxes from agriculture and feeding and taking care of the army, two most important things. Decisions connected with these two things rested with the king. Everything else was delegated to the local communities and work actually happened faster. Today we are struggling in my road to get the garbage cleared because the local guy has no authority. It's all that has to go. Everything has seems to go to ribbon building and come back and be like fighting with the day or that anyway, that's a separate story. But none of those things happened in the Chola period because it was a local community which was responsible for everything that was connected with the local period, which is why even if it was very difficult for on transport and communication, the Chola empire still survived because there was a lot of delegation available. You only need to pay tax to the king and you needed to not do stuff that would be competence. Treason, you are on the good side of the king, you are allowed to live your own life. Another shot of the uh, temple. This is a very beautiful um, temple which was built in the Nayak period. Uh, it's, a de it's a temple for Subramanya. Now when you go there, I've not got a, I mean I have a close up for this but it's not a, it's not a photograph that was taken in the 18th century so I've not included here. It's a very rare image of Purushamraga. Purushamraga is a mythical beast. It's half a sage and half a animal. So it looks like one of these senators kind of thing. It's very curious because this is a must have been some kind of a local deity of some sort in Tamil Nadu, which was then taken, which was then incorporated into the Mahabharata. So only the Tamil version of the Mahabharata has a story where the Purushamraga and Bhima have a fight with each other, and finally there's one version that Bhima wins and the other verse that Purushamaga wins. But the point that I'm trying to make is Purushamaga was a very great devotee of Shiva. And some of the Shiva temples, like Kabali Shura temple, they have a Vahana for Purushamaga as well. You find this Purushamaga uh, Vahana only in southern, uh, only in northern Tamil Nadu, <coughs> Arka district and Madras and stuff like that. When you go down to Tanjavur and Tunaveli, you don't find it, for whatever reason. But this uh, this water spout, water collection area has a small uh, sculpture of Purushamaka as well, which you should look at next time. The Supra also has right. So, but it's not a it's not a common Vahana, it's not even a Vahana in the Shiva temples, but occasionally you find an iconography and representation of this. Very unusual only to Tamil Nadu. So watch out for it. Interesting one. 
This is the back yeah, back side. Uh, you'll notice in those days, now they've uh, they've covered all this up with some kind of a, uh, well, not a cement of some sort. But you'll find this image of Tripurantaka repeating itself. Now, in started by the Pallava, there's a long tradition in Tamil Nadu of how kings have identified themselves with gods. And they've done it for very political reasons. <laughs> Paused for effect over there. <laughs> <laughs> now, you no, know, it made a lot of sense because um, if the king identified himself with God, then there was a lot more legitimacy in his rule. Right? And also, think about it this way: if a king spent all, if the Pallava king spent all his time in Kanjipuram, right? What will happen to his kingdom in Kichi or Tanjavur? What happened? Somebody will somebody will have a coup d'etat, right? They'll 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 have a military incursion and his position will be at stake. Therefore the king had to be on the move all the time, right? Just like I mean I have 15 days in a month, not very different like what you used to do in the past. They don't make that much of money. But they have to do it. They have to keep traveling all around the place. When they have to travel around the place, this then they needed certain powers of authority when they were not in town. Which is why the Pallava king started slowly investing in temples. This cult of equating the god and the king is a really old one. We find a lot of mention of this in the Vedas as well, of how Indra and, and, and the king are, are considered, or the clan chief is said to be the same. But the Pallava started it off. Favorite motive for the Pallavas was the Varaha avatar. Because in the Varaha avatar, Vishnu takes the form of a boar and he rescues who? Bhuma Devi or the goddess of birth. So the Pallava king was saying, just like Varaha rescues the earth, we will also save the earth and rescue them. So they were very fond of that image. Raja Raja was very fond of Tripurantaka. There was a story of Shiva where he, with one arrow, destroys three asuras in three different worlds. So this three is a very important number for Raja Raja because it signifies the Chera, the Pandyas, and the Kalingas in many of the northern dynasties as well. So Raja Raja was very fond of the Tripurantaka image because in the Tripurantaka image he saw himself. Which is why, and just to ensure that you don't miss that out, even if your mind is somewhere when you're visiting the temple, 90% of the images on the second level are all Tripurantaka. They're all Tripurantaka, so you can't miss it. In the bottom left also there are some Tripurantaka, but there are other people as well. But in the top, it is all Tripurantaka. And you can see in the old days, they have seemed to, you know, put some Kavi and all that on the floor, all that is course gone now. So that's this one's by Linear Slide again. Right? Let's look at Nicholas and Co. Not many photographs of Nicholas and Co, but uh, uh, they they for a short time operated in Madras uh, with the with a with a studio somewhere in Georgetown. ATW Penn was a photographer who lived and worked in Uti. And uh, while researching on this I was able to find out one of uh, Penn's great grandsons, and he's written an excellent book on the history of ATW Penn. So, for those of you who are interested in Uti, uh, Penn's autobiography is something that you should read and see his photographs because he took photographs only of Uti. John Nicholas seemed to have been in Tanjore for only a couple of days. We've only got two or three of his photographs. This is one nice one of the of the Nandi, um, and there's a little man over here to tell you, give you a sense of size. Um, this is not the original Nandi that Raja Raja intended. The original Gandhi that Raja Raja invented is somewhere else to the side. This was built during the Nayaka and there's some fancy stories about uh, about how it's always growing and all that stuff, which is absolutely not true. Uh, and there are a lot of other crazy stories like that, which I'm sure you all know about. That the, the Shikara is made out of one piece of stone, not true. Uh, that the Vimana, the, the shadow doesn't fall on the roof, not true again. In fact, my first visit to the big temple seven years back, there was a guy who was talking to talking about this to a bunch of tourists and he was standing on the shadow. <laughs> on the shadow and saying, they were believing it. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't think, right? So that's a nice photograph. I put this in because it's a, it's a nice one of the Nandi. You don't find photographs of the Nandi very often. I think people seem, the old photographers seem to focus on the, pink, the, the big temple much more. Nicholas obviously had a different idea. 